Welcome to our lecture on Plato's political thought. We started talking about the ancient uh, thought about politics, about the world, their pursuit of meaning, of knowledge. And you read uh, from the textbook on Plato and on Aristotle. Today, uh, I will try to synthesize some of the aspects of Plato's political thought so that you try to make sense of what you've read previously uh, from the textbook. So, as we discussed, the ancients, not only the ancients, any serious political thinker, any serious political philosopher, starts from the question, or for, from the uh, pursuit, rather, of truth, or of meaning. As any of us, we are born, uh, and as we grow up, we look around and try to make sense of the world that we inhabit. Political thought, in a way, is part of that attempt. It's part of that attempt of making sense and of trying to understand what should I do? How should I live? More broadly, how should we live? That, in fact, is political philosophy in its essence. So, let's start from this, this question, right? What is the right way to live? What is truth? What is meaning? First thing that we need to understand, and we need to cover, is that the ancients lived in a different sort of a universe. Or rather, the world was the same, of course, the human beings were the same. Their understanding of the whole was different. And let me depict it this way. For the, for the ancients, everything was one, right? The entire world was a unit. Now this might seem, well of course, self-understood. Not really, it's not really, and as we go on in our discussion of different political philosophers, you realize this is not something to be taken for granted, and actually our view is different. But let me, let me explain what I mean by this. I, as we discussed this week, in some of the materials I posted, the pursuit of meaning or of order which is actually the question, you know, uh, what is, how does this world work and how should I act within it? Right? Starts from the awareness that the world has in it disorder. It has suffering, it has accidents, it has evil, right, of whatever sort we consider it to be, you know, hatred. But the fact that I perceive that there is disorder in the world means that implicitly I assume or I have a knowledge of order. I can perceive that something is disordered if I don't know in, inside that what order is. Right? For something to be broken, it means that there is a way for it to work well. Right? So that's the conundrum. In fact, that's the tension of all political thought up to this day, of all political ideologies up to this day. The conundrum is this tension, this tension between order and disorder. The disorder that I perceive and the order that I know is there but I can't really see it happen. Or it happens only in parts. And the attempt always is to, well how should we put this straight? How should we go in the right direction? Right? Now, this is where this picture, which I would call the cosmological, not me, but you know, the literature calls the cosmological perspective on the universe, on the world, this is where it comes into play. For the ancients, and by the ancients you'll see I mean pre-Christian, and also I exclude the, Jew, the, the Jewish people from this because they brought in a different perception, as we'll talk about later. So for the ancients, the world was one. What does this mean? It means that the world that is disordered, Right? Is disordered is disordered throughout. That means that it is disordered both in the individual human being here, this is a human being, in the city, and everyone can agree with the fact that we look at politics and we're always dis disappointed, right? There is disorder there. But also in what they consider to be the gods, right? Zeus, Aphrodite, whatever. Right? The entire, the gods and the world, this world and what we call that world, right?
together are part of the same disorder. And this is a very important thing because then the question becomes, okay, but if everything is disorder, where do I go to find the source of order? Now this might seem very esoteric, very abstract at first, but you'll see that it, it will make a lot of sense and it's very important to understand. So this is the world. The entire world is disorder, and yet I have to struggle. I try to struggle to find order, right? Philosophy is the love of wisdom. Philosophia, the love of wisdom. What is wisdom? It's knowledge. What is knowledge? It's our understanding of the truth of things. Right? That's knowledge, right? From mathematics to music to whatever. When our thoughts correspond with reality, that we call, that's what we call knowledge. Right? Understanding or wisdom. So this is the context. This is the context. And we'll get back to this, within which philosophers need to find order. But where do you find it? What you find is if, if everything there is, gods, men, sea, beasts, animals, everything has both disorder and order. It seems that it's either a desperately disordered this world, and there's no chance to find order, or what? So this, this is the context within which Plato uh, lives and uh, works. So let's talk a little bit about Plato. Um, and uh, his dialogues, especially the Republic. So who was Plato? Plato was a disciple of Socrates. Socrates, uh, the most famous philosopher in history, who never wrote a word, uh, who, however, shaped the way we think, we think and we talk about things up to this day. Socrates was uh, born in 470 BC, died in 399 BC, and contrary to you know, common opinion that philosophers live in some sort of an ivory tower, Socrates' was, uh, Socrates's career, just like every Greek person's career, you remember from my notes, were, uh, you know, had, the career happened in the city and also on the battlefield. Socrates had a very prestigious, well-recognized history of heroism in battle. He was a, what we would call a decorated soldier. He didn't have decorations, but he was, his name was known as, 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 as a very brave soldier in the many wars in which Athens participated. Remember our discussion of Athens and the Greek world, right? which you need to know. So Socrates had this experience, but after his youth, most of his life was spent basically going around and asking questions. Right? This is the so-called Socratic questioning. What, why was he asking questions? Was he just bored, didn't know what to do? No, of course. The reason for asking these questions is to always try to go further towards testing the knowledge of others. Right? He was told that, well, there are people who know things. Yes? He said, okay, let, let's see. He went around and he asked questions. He asked questions to see if they truly know things, the important things. So he went and talked to craftsmen and he discovered that, well, they know things, but things that are not that important. They're important in their uh, you know, uh, job, profession, but not grandly speaking, and, and so on and so on. Uh, and he went to the poets, politicians, right? and he, he saw that their knowledge either is true but limited or it's actually false. At the end, how did he die? Well, he was put on trial for many reasons. There's a lot of discussion here with the Athenian wars and whatever. But he was put on trial and he was accused of corrupting, corrupting the young and undermining the existing um, system, civic religious system of Athens. And Basically, he was condemned to death. Well, he, in the end, he had to drink poison. Uh, the point is that this quest for truth, this quest for, for knowledge, since then, up to today, has been dangerous. People, us, we do not like, perhaps, we feel uncomfortable with pursuing some questions 
And we do not like to be uh, challenged, especially in uh, certain things that just help us be successful in daily life. Right? Socrates couldn't do else, couldn't do it otherwise. He had to do this. But Plato was one of his disciples. It's not disciples, pupils rather. And Plato, it's Plato who wrote philosophical treatises, which are actually not philosophical treatises, but they are dialogues. And it's from his dialogues mostly that we know about Socrates and what we know about Socrates. Other writers wrote about Socrates, but it's mostly from what we know from Plato. Let's move to talk about Plato. Plato, uh, born in 428 BC, in a time of unrest, cultural, political, and so on, in Athens, of course. He founded uh, the Academia, um, which is the model for, you know, how our school, right? academy. And he continued this pursuit of truth. And in his, you know, he, uh, the writings that we still have from him that are all written, or most of them are written in this format of dialogues. And why are, why are these dialogues? They're different characters, right? E debating an issue. And very often Socrates is one of the characters in the dialogue. Why not? Why not just well, tell you like this? And this has to do with, with the Socratic conception of the pursuit of the truth. That in a dialogue you participate, you are helped through a dialogue to participate as an actual uh, member of the discussion rather than just a spectator, right? There's a dialogue, you take sides in a dialogue. You identify with different positions. Right? And in the end it is up to you. It is up to you to integrate whatever answers you find. To find this, in a way, you have to identify and find the answers within yourself. And this doesn't mean that whatever you choose to find is true. No, that's wrong, according to Plato or Socrates. Truth is not relative. Right? Mathematics is not relative. Reality is not relative. Right? And so, but it's up to you because Understanding the truth of life, the truth about how you should live, is something that you have to do because it, the main question is not what, I, what do I know, right? But the main question is how should I live? How should I live? Well, you can only answer this question if you ask it from yourself. If you really go in and ask yourself, how should I live? Is my life true in pursuit of the truth according to the truth right. okay this is the context so let's 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 look then at one of his dialogues the republic which starts as you as you read in the textbook with the question and throughout the republic he pursues the same question what is justice justice which is one of the terms you actually mentioned in in the, in the discussion section Justice is understood in this Greek context not as law, right? Which might be an aspect of it, but justice is what is just, rather. Right? What is right? What is the right way to live? In that sense, what is justice? And that applies to the individual, of course, it applies to the society, and so on. Note, as I mentioned that before, that all serious philosophers who wrote about political philosophers, who wrote about politics, start from the same question, right? What is the right life? And even deeper than that, what is the human being? They try to understand the human being, try to build an anthropology, in order to then uh, answer the question, if this is the human being, then how should he live? What is the good life? And then, moving on to the question about society. How should we live? What is the human being? How should a human being live, how should we live? Because right. unless you know what a human being is, what's good for the human being, and how should he should live, how can you answer the question, right? What is, how should we live as a society? And that's true for, as I mentioned, your, um, when you brought up the, uh, the, the idea of freedom in the discussion, because that freedom is one of the assumptions that we have about 
what is the best for the human being today. Right? But it wasn't before and we'll see that. So the question is what is justice? How should a human being live justly? What does justice actually mean? Well, to answer this question, Plato had to ask right, the question, to look into the question of what is the human being? Right? And because the human being is so complex, so intricate, and it's hard to know the human being when you look too closely, he proposes, actually Socrates in the dialogue proposes to his uh, partners of dialogue, to kind of use another tool to, to understand man. In other words, he says, well, it's hard to look into the human being, let's look at the city. Because the, the, the city, society, is human being writ large. The city is human being writ large. And that's true, it's true in a way in which it's not immediately apparent for us. Namely, a city in the Greek sense, let's say this is a city, right, it's made of human beings. But it's not just a gathering of random human beings, Remember my notes about how the Greek city was very organic, very intertwined, right? It was based on actual relationships that were very uh, often uh, blood relationships. It was made of different clans and so on. Uh, it was a very limited space territorially, but also very limited in terms of its membership. You could live here forever, <laughs> your entire life, and yet not be a member of it, right? So the city is this organic thing, which means that the nature of the city, right, how it works, is shaped by the relationships between these people and by who these people are and how they behave and how they act and so on. Right? This system of relationships between human beings, between the, the members of the city, is actually what? The constitution of the city. And this constitution of the city, meaning the way it works, right, is shaped by each individual human being's character, person, personality, and the relationships that are established between these different personalities. If, if this is so, and it, is, it was such in the Greek city state, of course it's different today, because we can live in a suburb, not know your neighbor, have no relationship between, you know, 30,000 people live in a, some suburb, they only go there to sleep, right? So how does that make it a city? It doesn't. And Aristotle later will say, it's not enough to live together in the same space, under the same laws even, right, as we live today, if those human beings don't have relationships, if those human beings don't interact constantly. Because that's what makes it a city, a society. Of course, that's not necessarily how we live it always, today. Uh, things have changed. So, if this is a city, then indeed, the city is human being writ large. Well, let's look at the human being. The human being, uh, in Plato's perspective, of course, I'm, you know, synthesizing here, right? Uh, and if you, when you're going to read the Red Republic, you see it's, it's a more uh, interesting discussion. But synthesizing, the human being, according to Plato, and not only him, he asks, so what are the main drives, the main elements, uh, the main components of a human being? That makes him or her a human being. So if this is a human being, in his conception, there are three major drives or powers or aspects or in that, that shape a human being. There is a rational part, there is a spirited part, and there is an appetitive part. Reason, spirit, appetite. What are these? Think of these as, as drives or inclinations of the human being. Reason is the part of the human being that helps him, allows him to know things. Is the part that allows for knowledge. It's the part that is connected, that reflects the relationships that exist in the world. Right? We talked about the fact that in the world, right, there is disorder, but there is also order. What, what is order? Order is relationships. Relationships between elements in reality. And that's what order is. Relationships that continue, endure. Right? Well, reason is the part in us that, for some reason, for, for some, uh, uh, we don't know why, 
it actually can understand these relationships. In many ways it seems that these relationships are reflected in our own reason, in our own capacity for knowledge. Right? So reason is the part in Greek nous that allows for knowledge. And this again applies starts from mathematical knowledge uh, to uh, you know astronomy to physics uh, to music to uh, ethics to everything it's all one it's only later that we separate these aspects of life order is order and the universe is one right the, the world is one so to speak in the greek sense so that's reason right it allows us to know it also to know truth but also to know once we know truth what is right and what is wrong Right? Truth and untruth, right and wrong, these are uh, these go along the same paths. These correspond with each, with each other. So once knowledge in this sense, knowing the truth is knowing also what is false, right? What is wrong. Ethically, uh, philosophically and so on. The spirited part is the part that drives that we would perhaps associate today with the will, is the determined part right? in us. The thing that pushes us towards action. Fact, the, the third part, the appetitive part, is the other impulse in us which uh, drives us to satisfy our desires. Mostly, not only, but from the most basic ones, from hunger, thirst, and so on, to uh, uh, other desires, you know. But it's, it's, it, it is associated with desire. Now, if these are the main parts in the human being, then you will see, obviously, that different human beings will be uh, determined, will be run, will be ruled by different aspects of, of their uh, being. Right? Some people are ruled by the rational part. And again, rational part doesn't mean, as you understand, it's really science. Right? There is no separation between knowing uh, as what you understand today as science and uh, today we separate it from ethics and so on. It's, it's one knowledge. It's one capacity to understand the order of the of the whole. Right? It's one, including the order about gods, the truth about gods. Right? That's still part of knowledge. So some are ruled by this part. Some, however, are ruled by the spirited part. It's the let's do things part that drives them. And some are ruled by the appetitive. Now, 